Computer Philosophy's London Lectures for 2020. 21. Um, it's a good evening here in the UK, 6.30 p.m., but it's a very uh, uncomfortable good morning in South Korea. Our speaker is 3.30 a.m. there, so we're very, very grateful to Hei Kim for uh, <laughs> to give this talk. The subject is individual freedom in the post-corona era, a very important topic, a very interesting topic, and I'm pretty sure that if you've been following the coverage in the Western media for the audience who are from the West, then what you're going to hear this evening is going to give a very fresh and revealing angle on that topic. Let me introduce Heisu Kim. She's the 16th president of Iwa Women's University in uh, Serling, South Korea. And her philosophical interest has been focused on philosophical methodologies and comparative studies between philosophies East and West. Now, she's actually been a very influential philosopher in an organizational sense as well. She's filled leading posts in national and international academic societies. She's been president of the Korean Philosophical Association, and she's been the committee member for the International Federation of Phil Philosophical Studies, and also has been one of the nine board members of the International Association of Women Philosophers. So not only is she an excellent philosopher, she's done so much for the profession of philosophy and bringing people together globally. So what's going to happen is we're going to listen to the talk. Uh, it's going to take around about half an hour. And um, please do give us your questions. It should be self-evident. You put them in the comments section of wherever you're watching. And talking about wherever you're watching, you can follow us on YouTube. You can sign up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you press the right button, you'll be notified when something new comes up, or you can follow us on Facebook and those addresses are there. So first of all, let's have the talk and then we'll have a discussion to follow. Hello, English audience. I'm very much uh, pleased to be uh, participating in the uh, Royal Institute of Philosophy talk today. My talk will be on individual freedom in the post-corona era. A column published in the French Business Daily Les Echo in April 6 under the title COVID-19 and Tracking, Let's Not Sacrifice Our Liberties, opined that Korea, South Korea's administrative policy of tracing the movements of confirmed cases and making tracing information available to the public was perhaps one of the worst cases in terms of the respect for individual freedom. The author, lawyer Virginie Pradel, opposed discussions in France that were in favor of adopting a similar contact tracing system as Korea's. The Korean embassy in France immediately complained to Les Echo, and John Hae Eung, the director of Korean Cultural Center in Paris, submitted a rebuttal to the Daily under his name on April 14. He said, the South Korean government and its citizens are very committed to the fight against the virus, he said, adding that all measures taken are based on laws and approved by Korean citizens. In the age of COVID-19, we are witnessing the conflict between the right to pursue individual freedom and the moral obligation to ensure the safety of the community and our neighbors from the spread of the virus. This conflict often arises in instituting policies concerning the wearing of masks, building contact tracing systems, and limiting various cultural activities, including religious gatherings. The efficacy of wearing masks is now widely accepted across the East and the West. Not long ago, how, however, some considered the refusal to wear face masks as an act of protecting individual freedom, and some politicians, such as the former US President Donald Trump, exploited the anti-mask movement as a political symbol to create solidarity among their supporters. A societal controversy of this kind draws my thoughts to philosophical questions arising from the debate over state control and the protection of individual freedom. In the early stages of this crisis, China appeared to undergo a great deal of turmoil due to the exponential growth in confirmed cases, but the full deployment of its considerable state authority under the socialist system allowed it to avoid catastrophic damage at a relatively early point in time. 
As the success of pandemic response hinges on the efficiency of centralized disease control systems and the voluntary compliance of citizens, East Asian countries, including Taiwan, have experienced relatively low numbers of cases as compared to the US and European countries. In response to this, Western societies have begun to voice the criticism that the deployment of national surveillance systems, mandatory mask use, and movement restrictions infringe on the freedom of individuals and the East Asian countries have traditionally neglected individual freedom. Individual freedom connotes a number of philosophical issues that cannot be defined by a specific set of behaviors and criteria, as is in the case with abstract values such as love, justice, and righteousness. From a superficial perspective, as Virginie Prado pointed out, a government would indeed be violating individual freedom and the right to privacy if it imposes penalties on the refusal to wear a mask, prohibits entry into buildings without wearing a mask, utilizes location tracking software on smartphones to identify the movements of infected persons and makes such information public. How can the conflict of interest between the pursuit of individual freedom and public control be navigated in situations like the pandemic that affect individual countries as well as the entire world. It's the notion that restrictions on individual freedom are unavoidable to ensure the public interest and safety of society in accord with the ideology of liberalism. A number of Americans, including the former US President Trump and Europeans, regarded the mandatory use of facial masks as an invasion of individual freedom, and Virginie Pradel presumed that the location tracking of unconfirmed cases infringed on individual freedom and undermined the core values of liberal democracy. With regard to conflict between authority and individual liberty, English philosopher and liberal John Stuart Mill asserted in his book on liberty that individual freedom should in no case be violated unless it harms others. Quote, that the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any number of civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. He cannot right, rightfully be compelled to do or to forbear because it will be better for him to do so. In the part which merely concerns himself, his independence is of right absolute. Over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign." Unquote. Based on mere standards, the enforcement of mask wearing for infected persons does not infringe on individual freedom since their refusal to do so is likely to spread the coronavirus to others. Likewise, it is difficult to view the mask use mandate as a violation of individual freedom since even those who are not confirmed to have been infected may pass on the virus through a symptomatic spread. What about releasing information on the movement of infected persons to the public through location tracking? If the disclosure of such information can minimize the risk of infection for others, the restriction of an individual's right to privacy may be justifiable. Then why are descendants of Mill in the West enraged by the measures taken by East Asian countries? And why do citizens of the said East Asian countries quietly comply with such measures? In Korea, although one intellectual ex expressed concern over the increasing state control over the public pandemic, the issue did not become a controversy under the public spotlight from the perspective of the infringement of individual freedom and a majority of the Korean public did not associate the matter of disease control with individual freedom. Rather, social criticism was directed against those who hid or lied about their movements 
which demonstrates the fundamental difference between East Asia and the West in terms of the relationship between the individual and the society. Coupled with news reports that China has developed an application that can pinpoint individuals with bad credit within a five meter radius of the user, it is clear that the norms adopted by each society to pursue social safety can greatly vary. In order to understand such norms, it is crucial to first understand the cultural backgrounds and contexts in which they are produced and consumed. Individual freedom is closely linked to the existence of an individual. The existence of an individual is essential as the subject in which freedom resides, belongs, and is realized. Democracy is a political system based on the existence of diverse individuals as citizens and free people. Mill and other liberals believe that the worth of a society or a nation constitutes the sum of individuals comprising it. A prerequisite for individual freedom is that an individual or individuality exists as a whole being or an absolute unit. The notion that an individual is the most basic element of a society is widely accepted in Western society, as is the idea that we all exist as separate individuals with our own rights, desires, and values. The concept of an individual or individuality, however, is not as simple as it seems at first glance. In the history of Western philosophy, the definition of an individual or individuality is a difficult and long-standing metaphysical question. Human beings do not simply exist in, abs in abstraction. Rather, they exist as a woman or a man, old or young, with long hair or short hair, tall or short, fat or skinny. In reality, an individual is a highly specific being. However, no matter how many properties and characteristics are used to describe an individual, it is difficult to absolutely specify the individual who exists here and now, since there may be many others who share such general characteristics in this world. For centuries, Western philosophers have struggled to identify the conditions under which A can be identified as A. The reason for the prevalence of the search for such conditions lies in Western Christian culture. One of core elements that comprise the Christian worldview is the salvation of souls after death. In order to attain ultimate salvation, a soul must establish a positive relationship with God and conform to Christian values by leading a moral and religious life. And what is saved by such a religious life is my soul, my soul, not those of my family or friends. Souls must remain absolutely individual as well as one's own and cannot be shared with other beings. A person's good deeds can save them, but not others. Responsibilities, duties, right, and rights pertaining to the outcome of a deed are completely vested in the individual who performed it, and they cannot be shared with one's parents or family members. The relationship between our soul and God is absolutely covenantal, even though the authority and social binding force of Christianity has waned. The idea of an individual as the solitary existence facing God is deeply ingrained as an ideal in laws and other social practices in Western societies. If an individual is accepted as one absolute unit, freedom can be referred to as the original state of an individual. The following paragraph by John Dewey helps us understand the concept of individual freedom as accepted in Western culture. Quote, Cicero had maintained that every man had its principles innate within him. The Roman law itself was most often used in the interest of absolutism, but the idea of a natural law and so of a natural right, more fundamental than any human dictate <clears throat> proved a powerful instrument in the struggle for personal rights and equality. All men naturally were born free, wrote Milton. To understand political power right, wrote Locke, and derive it from its original, we must consider what state all men are naturally in, 
and that is a state of perfect freedom. These doctrines found eloquent portrayal in Rousseau and appear in the Declaration of Independence of 1776 in the United States." Unquote. This perception of individual freedom forms the foundation for the strong resistance against the coercion of a person's will in any way and the invasion of privacy under the name of a government pursuit of public interest and even the guarantee of one's own interests. In the initial stage of the COVID-19 pandemic, Westerners expressed their disapproval of government measures or social influence to adopt practices that individuals may dislike, such as wearing masks and anger at the tracking of infected persons, which stem from the aforementioned perception of individuality that runs deeply in Western culture, namely, I belong to no one but myself. The threat facing such perception in the pre postmodern and post-coronavirus era and a world built on digital technology and the virtual space will be addressed at the end of this talk. The cultural traditions of Korea, Taiwan, and East, other East Asian countries were strongly influenced by Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. Among them, however, Confucian values have come to dominate everyday rituals, social norms, political power, and governing practices across Asia. This is partly because Confucianism is closely related to the specific moral norms that are followed in everyday life, ethics of social elites, uh, practical operation of an ideal life and bureaucratic rules of governance, while Buddhism and Taoism place greater emphasis on metaphysical questions than ordinary everyday life. In the Confucian tradition, an individual can never exist as an absolute unit. Individuals always exist in their roles to serve specific functions in familial relationships, which was regarded to reflect the order of heaven, the universe and nature. Within the family, there are specific roles, moral norms and duties that must be followed by the father, mother, sons, daughters and daughters-in-law. Under the long-standing cultural focus on filial piety, even an individual's body is bestowed by their parents and is not truly their own. Performing these individualized roles determines the existence of a person and the satisfaction and fullness of their life. This culture endured through to the modern age, whereby the awareness of an individual's roles and moral responsibilities takes precedence over that of individual rights. In Korean culture, an individual's existence is established as a function of networks rather than a unit with independent characteristics. This has led to the development of not only traditional networks, including families and clans, but also various pseudo-familial networks, such as hometowns, schools, and religious groups. Individual freedom in this type of society can be obtained when individuals fulfill given and expected roles within their networks to live up to their names and complete moral responsibilities that determine such roles. Individuals are not allowed to act as they please, and they do not belong to a self, but to a greater self like parents, families, and clans, or a group with a larger public cause like ethnic groups and nations. Individual freedom can be achieved only when networks that form individuals function as intended. The problem of individual freedom is revealed in various layers according to the way in which an individual is defined. Individual freedom presents the clearest view of an individual's existence. If individuals are recognized as independent beings and separate units that possess unique value of their own, individual freedom can be achieved at a level where individuality is maximized. In Western culture, individual freedom cannot be conceived separately from concepts such as individual autonomy, inalienable rights, the absolute value of existence, the achievement of individual desires, and free will. On the other hand, the concept of individual freedom entered the East Asian tradition since the late 19th century, when the Western democratic and legal systems began to take root as a phase of modernization. In Confucian culture, the prime state of existence for an individual 
is to play a given role in relationships and fulfill the consequent moral responsibilities. Individual freedom is secured within the accomplishment of the well-being of a close-knit community, such as a family or a clan to which they belong, as opposed to individual desires. My freedom is achieved by sharing happiness with family members, such as my parents and those who bear similar relations to me as my family. Individual desires that are independent of such relations are deemed to be selfish, and in most cases, the private is considered to have a lower value than the public, and the optimal state of individual existence is regarded as the accordance of public happiness with my own happiness. This is somewhat analogous to the state in Kantian ethics where a rule is that is valid only to me without universality is only considered as a subjective maxim, not a moral rule. Naturally, an emphasis on the importance of existence and the will of individuals can also be found in the Confucian tradition. For example, the Analect includes passages such as, quote, the commander of three armies may be taken away, but the will of even a common man may not be taken away from him, unquote. In Mencius, we may also find the passage saying, quote, therefore, all things of the same kind are similar to one another. The sage and I are the same in kind, unquote. Why didn't the, uh, these claims on the equality of rational ability and human dignity lead to, to protect individual rights? How did the notion of natural endowment in human beings give rise to the concept of natural rights in the West and that of natural duties in the East? An individual as a being situated in the network of human relations must take responsibility for ensuring the effective operation of the network to ensure that the network does indeed work. The individual's claim to their rights is often regarded as a selfish deed that may lead to the uh, network's malfunction or destruction. While the Chinese character Kong carries the meaning of public, open, official, fair, and universal, its counterpart, Sa, the literal meaning of private, has the negative connotation of being selfish rather than its literal meaning of private. Under this culture, individual freedom is achieved when the network operates in utmost harmony and the existential meaning of an individual fully manifests itself within relationships with others. Therefore, an individual feels a sense of fulfillment from life and confirms the significance of their existence by faithfully executing the social role allocated to them. One intriguing thing is that there is a moment in which individuality reveals itself, taking a relatively clear ethical significance in the Confucian tradition, namely when a subject plays their name on the line to submit an appeal to the king that runs contrary to the king's will or a decision based on social norms. In cases of political resistance, an individual reveals their individuality even more starkly and the spirit of defiance toward authority in which an individual stakes their life was sometimes accepted as one of cardinal virtues of Confucian intellectuals. In some ways, negatively speaking, it can be said that individual freedom is acquired through a struggle for recognition against the ruling power with one's life at stake. Throughout East Asian history, it was not uncommon practice to mount an open rebellion by leaving behind the public testament or committing suicide by self-immolation in a public manner to defend moral values such as chastity, loyalty, and faith, or resist unjust authority. Such cases represent extreme ways for an individual to pursue moral responsibility and freedom. In Confucian culture, social praises or punishments were imposed on a collective basis. In particular, the tradition of attributing individuals' fault to the group to which one belongs and punishing all of the group's members played, on a, cru played a crucial role in reinforcing collectivist behaviors. Family is not merely a community based on consanguinity, 
sanguinity, but also a political community and a community of common fate that shares both gains and losses. losses. Churches in modern Korean society are also presumed to function in a similar way to clans in, in a traditional society. In many cases, Koreans tend to project emotions that they have for their families or family relationships onto the groups to which they belong their human relationships. Individuals frequently form a sense of unity with others or a group outside of themselves to which they feel a sense of closeness. In this type of society, individual freedom is not an absolute value possessed by an individual, but the value created from numerous relationships such as such. The said value is flexible and readjusted based on the situation. In this context, East Asians tend to show greater flexibility in comparison to Westerners towards the social policy-based decisions uh, that are forced upon individuals under situations of social emergency. Instead of regarding policies such as compulsory mask use or disclosure of personal information of infected persons as the suppression of individual freedom, they regard such decisions as the price to pay for individual freedom under the specific situation of the COVID-19 pandemic. The compliance or at least the perception of compliance from the Western perspective displayed by individuals toward the state instituted policies that wield power within the public networks to which they belong is also rooted in the aforementioned relativistic calculation of an individual's freedom and rights. In this regard, when thus East Asian cultures the individual freedom as being infringed upon or damaged, this issue is inextricably linked with oppression, discrimination, and injustice, which are inflicted upon groups to which individuals belong. When one group suffers oppression or damage in any form, individuals in Confucian culture have a strong tendency to recognize the matter as though they own, their own rights have been violated or their freedom damaged. This aspect of East Asian culture provides fertile ground for collectivist behavior to thrive. Today, surveillance capitalism that is unfolding within the development of digital technology poses diverse challenges to individual freedom in both the East and the West alike. In a society where individuals are re re relegated to consumers, the desires of individuals are linked to those of other consumers and an individual's freedom is reduced to their freedom to purchase goods that other consumers purchase. Countless commercial advertisements and social networking services make it difficult for individual desires to escape from the networks of other people's desires. Ironically, individual freedom in a digital-based capitalist society becomes a relative facet which, whose value varies from moment to moment in connection to digital networks instead of possessing an absolute value. Next, let's examine this issue in more detail. The COVID-19 pandemic accelerated the advancement of online communication across the globe, which is rapidly replacing traditional communication methods throughout all aspects of human life, including politics, religion, art, and education. The post-pandemic world is unlikely to ever fully return to the previous normal. The development of fintech, financial technology, implies that capitalism will also be subject to many changes in the future. Companies such as Amazon or Google are shifting into corporate entities whose identities are difficult to define, and generalization of platform labor is creating other kinds of social problems. All online activities conducted by individuals, including online transactions or Google search, leave digital traces that are stored, classified, analyzed, processed, and used as data according to a desired purpose, serving as a means to create pro profit. Like it or not, and intended or not, 
we all exist today as chunks of big data and are almost transparently encapsulated by unknown strangers who handle our data for their own purposes. Human beings are trapped in a massive network of surveillance and the companies that operate this invisible surveillance system are accumulating enormous wealth. This era of surveillance capitalism is expected to expand with no end in sight. As the Internet of Things becomes more common and everything that exists in the world becomes smart, it will appear as though human beings are able to satisfy their desires more effectively and obtain objects of their desire as much as they want from a wider variety of choices. In an era of unprecedented convenience and automation, the expansion of individuals' desires and freedom also seems to have advanced much further than at any other phase in human history. However, is that really true? The source of power that will dominate the post-pandemic world lies in the revolution of digital technology. There are no headquarters of technological domination in the sense that technological development and the utilization of data do not take place in any fixed location. Likewise, there is no clear distinction between the exploiter and the exploited, whereas I can play a role of consumer on one platform, I can also become a producer by establishing another platform. I can buy books at an online bookstore, then sell them online as used books and construct a platform to sell used books on specific subjects alongside other sellers. We are living in an era in which it is difficult to even guess where digital technology might take us. At a time when an individual's existence is reduced to data, how should individual freedom be understood? An amazing, every choice that I make is analyzed using AI to offer me guidance on further potential options for the future. Is this a positive development in the sense that the stress of having to exercise free will to make a choice has been elevated? Nowadays, it is increasingly difficult to regard individual freedom as something that has an absolute value. Things that were previously understood to be my own rights, my own possessions, and my own desires are turning more and more equivocal. Upon choosing a book on Amazon, Amazon immediately tells you what other books were purchased by other users who choose the same book and leads you to make further purchasing decisions. This appears to be a similar mechanism to the practice of releasing the movement of routes of persons infected with COVID-19 in Korea and Taiwan, though in this case, infected persons are simply referred to using serial numbers. The only difference between the two aforementioned examples is that the information on books purchased by other users recommends me to make a purchasing decision, whereas the information about confirmed cases of COVID-19 suggests that I should avoid taking the same routes. Although Virginie Pradel regarded the disclosure of the movement routes of infected persons as surveillance that disregards freedom, this kind of practice is already taking place on numerous platforms under surveillance capitalism, and we willingly choose from the options recommended to us in the name of free will under an overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelming deluge of information. My desires and freedom exist as a function of enormous digital networks, or rather the result of the behavior of such enormous networks. What is especially intriguing is that this resembles the relationship-centered way in which the freedom of individuals is defined in East Asian culture. I cannot disregard uh, the notion that the situation that Western intellectuals might describe as barbaric will become much more commonplace in the future society of surveillance capitalism, which is sure to intensify in the post-pandemic world. Confucian culture has traditionally placed great value on individuals' acts of resistance to defend their freedom or the group or core system that they consider themselves to be a part of. In addition, Confucian culture places deep emphasis on the protection of moral principles 
based on humanistic values or moral sincerity towards pseudo-familiar relationships. What brings me to reflect upon aspects of Confucian culture that emphasize the protection of universal humanity and ethical sincerity rather than the fluid concept of individual freedom is that it has become nearly impossible for humans to live without Google or Amazon amidst of digital revolution. If we define individual freedom as having an absolute value, we cannot coexist with such corporate entities. In order to avoid falling into a nihilistic or pessimistic abyss of in thinking about the future of technological development, we must begin to approach individual freedom from a different perspective. In consideration of the coincidental nature of human life and the fragility of human existence, we must embrace the concepts of individual existence and freedom as values that are constantly being readjusted within the networks to which we belong. I would like to conclude my talk today by leaving you with one question. Is individual freedom a purpose in itself or a means to accomplish greater value beyond the freedom? Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Now, I mean, normally we would take up to about uh, the, the next hour of questions. Given that it's already six minutes past 4 a.m. in Korea, we, we, we may um, not put uh, Dr. Kim through that full ordeal, but please do submit questions through the comments, either if you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook. If you're, if you're doing it on YouTube in particular, try and keep them concise because after 200 characters, it will chop it up into uh, several small messages, which makes it more difficult to follow. I've got many questions of my own. Uh, let's let's start one, um, Professor Kim. You're suggesting that in the Confucian culture, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that freedom, the meaning of freedom is really something that we find within the, the network flourishing well. So essentially, if if my network, my community, whatever it is, if that's flourishing, I'm free in a sense. And if it isn't, I don't have individual freedom. Now, although I think a lot of people can understand the idea that there is a benefit in the community flourishing, I guess when you are steeped in the Western idea of, of freedom and liberty, what you're describing may sound positive, but it doesn't sound like freedom. So in what way is it freedom to be able to exist in the harmonious community? Um, I'm not quite sure whether uh, the Confucian culture or Confucianism itself has the con exact concept of uh, individual freedom that may correspond to the Western conception of individual freedom. Uh, the, the, the words uh, meaning individual freedom uh, was made uh, by Japanese uh, people uh, in the in the turn of the 20th century, and we now use that term "chayu," uh, meaning individual freedom. Uh, but the "chayu," the literal meaning of "chayu" is uh, it's uh, kind of motivating by oneself, motivating within oneself, not uh, not the. But 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 now uh, while I am saying this, I do not I do not quite sure about even the concept of individual freedom uh, used in the Western context. Uh, so uh, more or less, as you pointed out, the concept of individual freedom in the tradition of Confucian Confucianism, I think, is more or less close to the concept of kind of uh, individual uh, kind of satisfaction or happiness uh, with oneself, with the uh, family members, or uh, when they fulfill their own, their own uh, functions or social roles within the network of community. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering whether then, you know, we, we ought to just say that's not that's good but it's 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 not freedom i suppose I'm, I'm i'm trying to get clearer on whether the confucian system rejects the value of individual freedom or has a different notion of what individual freedom is um 
Mm. It, I'm not sure whether it's it's different. Different. Um, everyone, regardless east and west, everyone when one is uh, forced to uh, do something, or w w everyone feels a, some kind of coercion or oppression, uh, pressure or oppression. Uh, one may feel uncomfortable and do uh, we feel unfree. Uh, in that sense, I think individual freedom may be a universal concept or universal value. Uh, but uh, East Asian culture, people are not, uh, not we haven't been raised uh, being conscious of one's own freedom to make, uh, to fulfill your own uh, identity or your own existence. Uh, it's, it's um, I think it's really, nowadays many people are talking about individual freedom, especially in the context of political uh, context. Uh, but um, that, Individual freedom means usually free to the, the freedom of uh, expression of thoughts or freedom not to be forced by uh, the unwanted forces or political power uh, against one's own will. Uh, that kind of conception, uh, I think, originated from the influence by the Western culture. Okay. Um, thanks so much. Now, I, I want to, you said some very interesting things uh, early on about Mill's harm principle. And I think, so So the, the harm principle, just as a reminder, is that he thought that the only justification for restriction of liberty was to prevent harm to others. And you, your own mm -hmm. good, your own welfare, spiritual, physical, was irrelevant. So in other words, if you wanted to do something that harmed yourself, you were free to do it as long as it didn't harm others. Now, what I find interesting in what you said, uh, Professor Kim, was that it sounds like you think that if we take Mill's harm principle, then the kind of restrictions that people object to, particularly around location tracking and masks, Mill's harm principle suggests those are legitimate principles. So that even without a Confucian critique, even as it were on the core principles of individual liberty held on the West, these, these um, restrictions should be acceptable. So, so why do you think there's been this mismatch between this fundamental principle and, and the way people actually respond to it, which is to perceive it as a restriction of individual liberty? Ha have we somehow in the West forgotten <laughs> what our own value of liberty is supposed to be? Yeah, I think, I think, I think so. Uh, the, the, uh, what triggered me uh, to to talk about this is the uh, Virginie Prado's criticism. The, why why does she or why do many Westerners feel uh, harmed by the uh, policy of wearing mask? Do you do you feel? I'm wondering, uh, I, I, I myself have a question. Do you feel your own freedom is harmed or violated, uh, infringed by the, the government action of uh, encouraging wearing masks? Um, I don't personally, and I think it is a, is a division in our society at the moment. I think that there are lots of people um, well, there's a small minority who are protesting vigorously, a larger group, and I don't know if, uh, who, who are against, but opinion surveys suggest that most people do support these measures. So I, I, I rather suspect that maybe the majority of people do understand that this is not just a, an arbitrary restriction of freedom, but something necessary for the good of everyone. So in that sense, perhaps it's a more, well, from my point of view, more optimistic picture than those pictures of the protesters might suggest. But I think the point is people do think, I think perhaps people do have a sense that there is something being asked of them which is exceptional, maybe, rather than it's just, of course you do this because it's for the common good. But um, 
I'll, I'll come to some questions. We've got some good questions coming in from the audience already. And I've got one here from Olivia Andrews, which relates, I thought one of the most fascinating things about your talk was the way in which you contrasted the rise of surveillance capitalism with the kind of you know measures we see in South Korea. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the idea really was that, um, and it seemed to me that the way you put it, it made it seem very strange that while people looked at the measures taking place in South Korea and thought they were terrible infringements of individual liberty, as consumers in Western culture, they are willingly participating in, in, in economic ecosystems in which exactly the same kind of surveillance is being applied to them, but not for a global health benefit, but in order to maximize the profits of certain um, organizations. So Olivia Andrews had the question, why do you think the overt physical restrictions on individual liberty was opposed, were opposed by protesters in the West, yet they do not seem to be as distressed by the violations from tech companies. Do you have any idea about why there's this mismatch? Uh, I because it is not not seen the violation or the uh, or the restrictions or the uh, or their their action not action their intention to guide people's desire to somewhere or uh, people's choices to something uh, they're usually their uh, intentions are not seen. Uh, in public. So we are not very much conscious of what's going on behind the, the, the scene of the culture we are very much used to in this consumer society. I think that the, this, this, this match originates from that kind of uh, differences. Yeah, I mean, that is interesting. It's rather, I find that slightly pessimistic, though, because so much has been said in a way everyone should know <laughs> that the algorithms are directing them and pushing them but it seems that people because it's not overt people think that somehow amazon is just just being helpful rather than trying to mm -hmm. nudge your desires um i i, I do think that's, and there's that's no physical restrictions also <laughs> yes there are no right. physical no. restrictions yeah Rather, there are all encouragements of, uh, and they 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 are uh, producing very much eulogical uh, expressions. It's for your profits and it's for your uh, desires, and uh, we are serving uh, mm. your desires, mm. so, not so I'm, restricting I'm or not limiting. Hmm? Yeah, so I'm wondering here then whether there's some kind of illusion that we, that we have in the West, because the idea that we are autonomous agents is so strong that unless we are physically being prevented from something, we genuinely believe that we're doing things of our own free choice. And we don't recognize the extent to which we exist in a network and that our desires are being created by others, affected by others. Um, in that sense, do you think that the Western conception of individualism is, in, in effect, simply Im empirically unrealistic and that the relational ideas we have in East Asia have a more, how can we say, have a more realistic understanding of human beings as social creatures? Yeah, I, I, whether, whether you can whether you can term it as uh, uh, more realistic or not, um, the I find a strong similarity between the contemporary capitalist society, the phenomenon in our uh, capitalist society, and and the phenomenon I am very much used uh, in this East Asian society. Um, 
the individual freedom as developed in Western culture becomes more and more ideal, not as you might uh, express the term, the, you, you might use the term uh, realistic. Uh, we do not know exactly what individual freedom uh, means in this kind of society. We are all related, uh, the, the relational uh, ac uh, aspect is even more strengthened uh, when, when you think about internet space. Uh, internet space is not uh, absolutely given, it's, it's, it's uh, relationally made. It's expanding by more relations are built. So uh, more and more, even in Western society, the concept of individual freedom becomes very unclear and equivocal. That's what I'm observing. Yeah, no, I think that's very, very true. I mean, one thought I'll just throw in to leave there is um, I think sometimes when Westerners think there is this conflict between in individual freedom and being more part of a, a, a group. Um, I like mm -hmm. to give an example examples within Western culture of where we can sometimes sometimes recognize the fact that individual freedom is best found in a group. And I think the example I give is, is of a, a jazz group. A jazz group mm -hmm. is one in which the individual is very much able to express themselves, but only that possibility only emerges because they are in, in a group and in community. And I think it's, it's perhaps quite an hopefully a nice way of, of suggesting that it may not be an either or choice. Let me take another question from, this is an interesting from John Caleja. I'm pronouncing that as if it's Spanish. Apologies if it's not. Um, and he's asking, is the fundamental project of Confucianism justice rather than an individual fulfillment? I mean, if not justice, I mean, I'm aware of the fact that when I started looking at Confucian philosophy and I was reading secondary sources, Everybody says how, how harmony, harmony is the key concept in, in Confucianism, social harmony, maybe that rather than justice. So, um, and I suppose the point of the question here is, to forgive me if I'm wrong, John, is that, in a sense, is, is the kind of more co collectivist relational vision that we're putting forward, one which does put the, yeah, the, the goal isn't individual fulfillment. For straight, it's as simple as that. The goal is societal flourishing. Well, individual fulfillment uh, means uh, something that you have certain satisfaction or fulfillment within the community where you belong. So uh, we also have individual fulfillment, but uh, that fulfillment comes from wider context, not just from your own self, your own activities uh, or, or, your, the, or, or the results uh, from your own actions. So um, I cannot say that justice is more valuable within a Confucian society uh, we ha we have I think we have developed another sense of justice um, in Aristotle's uh, philosophy. Justice uh, is described as uh, fulfilling one's one's own lot. Uh, the, uh, we have to uh, mm, serve others as that persons as as those people are uh, in in accordance with the roles or the lots uh, those persons have so each person has his or her own lot so the just society is the society where each person uh, performs his own role or performs his own uh, fate or lot. So in that sense, that kind of just that kind of concept of justice we can find also in the Confucian culture. But um, 
the most important value, I think, in Confucian society is, as you mentioned, harmony, I think. Harmony among various people, harmony among uh, family members, but those family members are not equal uh, in accordance from the perspective of Western uh, standards. Uh, so um, the, I think, uh, but harmony, but the harmony concept, the harmony is itself a a uh, is, is is not a very clear concept. It's al already a very much a, a prejudiced, uh, especially uh, because Confucian society is very much patriarchal. So from women's perspective, uh, harmony is not. Is not the value uh, cherished. Should that should be cherished? Should, should cherished because uh, it always involves certain uh, sacrifice of certain family members. So uh, the concept of a harmony is not also that clear concept, and it can be defined uh, depending on per uh, people's in own interests. So the harmony from the perspective of the, the real ruler would be difficult, uh, would be different from the harmony uh, from the perspective of the, the ruled. Yeah, I mean, that is interesting. And of course, you know, tra traditional Confucianism is patriarchal as well as very hierarchical. Um, a lot of contemporary Confucians, though, argue that the fundamental principle can be updated and, and, and we can have this value of social harmony in a more equitable way. Um, from, from your previous answer, I wasn't sure whether you were skeptical about that. Um, do you think we need to re reject the value of harmony or update it so that harmony doesn't actually mean in practice um, serving the interests of the most powerful? Hmm. Well, I think if, if we can make it, uh, uh, we can polish that kind of concept uh, in, in accordance with our uh, interests or our hope, uh, but it's it would be very difficult to do that. I think, uh, but uh, but uh, I'm also doing that kind of uh, philosophical polishing work uh, to make many uh, patriarchal value laden concepts. Uh, I, I want to make those concepts into other uh, more uh, uh, more uh, fresh concepts, um, but um, um, it's really difficult work because uh, I'm also laden by the traditional concepts and the traditional culture, and we have to define the concept of. Uh, uh, harmony or filial piety and familial love, uh, all those values must be redefined in terms of the uh, uh, human relations uh, changed throughout the, the, the past history. I think the idea of finding individual fulfillment through one's place in the network of relations is an interesting one. I do wonder whether perhaps if someone just observed uh, Western culture, one would come to the conclusion that it's actually very Confucian, given that still most people choose to make a major part of their personal fulfillment uh, starting a family and having those family <laughs> relations. Uh, and that's well understood. This is about It's about individual freedom, which is about doing your role properly with others and you you can't be fulfilled as a parent for example if you are purely selfish you have to give up something of yourself i do find that interesting i've got a question here from alexander vladimirov and this is interesting because in particular you were just saying before about how you have to kind of you know you you have to work with the concepts that you have and these concepts frame the debates and he's asking whether the individual others distinction is something which is he calls it a malfunction of language and I suppose I'm interested to know whether or not in Korean 
and in Chinese, I don't know if you know um, any other East Asian languages too. Whether or not the very language, um, whether the language uh, uh, frames that distinction differently or not, is there anything to yeah, this? Yeah, I, I think it much. Yeah, I think it much depends on the language we use. I think uh, English uh, sentence always has have to have uh, the subject and verb and object, but in Korean language, uh, you can omit the subject sometimes and many times and, and and it's interesting to observe that uh we use the uh the liter the word uh our in the place that we have to use the term i or my for example uh Many male people are using uh, our wife when they refer to his own wife. And I'm calling my mother our mother in Korean terms, uh, meaning my mother. And my family, I'm using the word our family. That way, uh, language influences what we think about individual freedom or, or what we think about uh, individuality. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure whether which which comes first, language comes first, or the the other uh, conventions on living experience come first. So uh, the living experiences so make. Uh, the word or the use of word, but I think th definitely language uh, uh, matters in thinking about this kind of problem, the relation between individual uh, and society. Yeah, it's really there. Uh, language problem is there. I'm glad that I'm glad okay. about about this question. Yeah. And actually, just to follow up on that, because another thing, I think in Japanese it's the case, and I don't know if it's the same in Chinese too, that actually uh, the way in which you refer to yourself and other people often highlights the relationships between the, each other in ways that don't in, in, in English. In English, it's, you know, I, me, you. We use the same pronouns, and it doesn't really matter who we're with in, in French, in some Mediterranean languages, there's a, a difference between formal and informal. That's the most it goes to. Uh, in, in Korean, are, are there differences in, in, in how you refer to yourself and others that highlight relationships more or, or not? Uh, what, 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 what is your question about uh, the, uh, the, the pronouns? Well, it may, it may. I think in Japanese it's about pronouns, but it could be wrong. I don't know Japanese. Maybe they don't even use pronouns. But I understand that um, in the way in which you talk about yourself and others, um, the the way in which you would speak would in itself make the nature of the relationship more explicit more often than it would in English. And I, I don't know. Um, you just say, you just use the word I or me, but uh, when we refer to ourselves, uh, we use different words depending on people I am talking to. Mm. So when yeah. I talk with the person of higher rank or, or senior people person, then I use the wo different words than I uh, than the one I'm using to my friends or to my uh, students or my family uh, sons. So, so, so it's, it's, yeah, there are uh, many ways uh, to refer to oneself, depending on the context, depending on the situations. That's, I think, true. Uh, uh, Japanese language and Korean language have a lot common. Okay. Uh, the, what, one of our questioners wanted you to comment on the, the comparison between 
the Confucian views and those of Martin Buber. But I also think I think it's always unfair to ask someone to to comment specifically on a particular philosopher as though you're supposed to be an expert on every philosopher in the world. But um, if you do have anything to say about Buber, do th throw it in later. Um, but we, a question I do have from um, Flower Dong, who asks, what is the implication of this potential violation of freedom for the education system? And I think the, the, perhaps the, the second point is, is clearer. Is there anything we can do to change the education curriculum to make a difference? So, I mean, I could take this as a, as a general question. Um, is there anything in your views which you think has implications for our education system and how we should be teaching and what we should be teaching? Um, um, I came to, uh, while I was working on this paper, I came to uh, have a question of my own that is whether uh, is individual freedom a kind of psychological state or is individual free the concept of individual freedom uh, has a kind of objective condition or uh, kind of objective uh, uh, dimensions where we can uh, talk about something or some rules or some kind of conditions must be satisfied uh, to measure individual freedom is uh, to measure uh, a individual freedom in a society. So uh, th that's the one question. But concerning an educational system, I think the most important thing when we talk about uh, education is to uh, build uh, pride or the respect for oneself uh, within our within educational system, so, um, that kind of uh, pride or respect of oneself uh, uh, can give a, a student a sense of. Um, a sense of uh, individuality and in kind of sense of what uh, one wants to be or what one wants to live in this kind of society uh, so that uh, he or she can be, uh, she can have uh, an experience or awareness when his or her right is infringed. Uh, so, uh, so th to have that kind of center within oneself is, I think, uh, very important uh, in education. Uh, so uh, many curriculums, I think, must consider about that kind of aspect, how to, val how to build up valuing oneself. Um, the, the question you left us with, I uh, can't remember the exact phrasing of it, but I think we ought to, to come back to that to see perhaps what your, mm -hmm. your own answer is. I think the, the, the gist of the, yeah, which was uh, essentially one I think about whether or not freedom is seen as kind of the, the absolute value or whether freedom is really in the service of, of other values. Um, I assume your answer to that is that freedom is not the absolute highest value in itself is that correct and, and if so what is what is what is the purpose of freedom if you want to put it in that way mm -hmm. i found an interesting uh, uh phrase in mill uh, when he talked about uh, suicide he said um, that the purpose of liberty is to uh, allow a person to pursue his own interest uh, from that aspect, uh, well, one does not, one is not free to terminate his own freedom, because to suicide is to terminate his own uh, own uh, liberty to pursue his own interest. So to terminate his own interest, it, terminate his ability to pursue his own interest. So. Uh, it's 
Um, I don't think that uh, we have uh, very much or very concrete uh, goals when we talk about uh, the values we have to cherish. Uh, there is no end for love. There is no ultimate goal uh, for uh, justice. Or in that way, there is no ultimate goal of the individual freedom. I think individual freedom itself is valuable because we are free. We must be free being, and we must uh, lead our life as a free individual. I think uh, I I I want to live as I want to live. Uh, so I don't. And think that there is a, 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 a goal, but individual freedom as a value is one of values we we cherish in our life. It's not the only value. Uh, it's not the uh, the value that other uh, values must tend to it. So in that sense, I think uh, individual freedom can be made relative to other values. Uh, it's not the ultimate only value we have to cherish. There are many other values like uh, safety, social safety also is a, is, is a value that we may cherish. So uh, now uh, as the, the, the uh, uh, Virginie Pradel uh, is talking about kind of conflicting situation, whether we have to value individual freedom more or we have to value uh, social safety or the public safety more. So uh, there are many values uh, in our society we have to cherish, but depending on situations we are in, uh, we may uh, may order or we may make some kind of uh, adjustment in the values in the relations of values um, depending on the on, 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 on the situation we are located in okay now I'm very aware of the fact it's approaching quarter to five in the morning where you are so I don't want to keep you um, much longer but <laughs> yeah. I think just uh, if I can keep you slightly longer I'm, I'm struck by so often many of the it's things okay, that yeah, you yeah. say. Yeah, many of the things you say, I, I can recognise versions of them in in Western culture. Um, for example, when you say this idea that an attack on one is an attack on all, that's a kind of phrase which people have used in Western contexts. So, for example, when we had those terrorist attacks in in Paris a few years ago, uh, the, the, I think the New York Times had a, had a headline saying we are all prisons, we're all French. It's a sentiment we recognise. And um, so I do wonder, I think a lot of the time, I'm very much inspired here by um, something Tom Kasulis said, who's a, a comparative philosopher, which is that people tend to assume that there are these binary distinctions between Eastern and Western thinking, and that, you know, you've got to choose one or the other. Whereas he says that generally speaking it's more of a matter of the emphasis so his phrase is that what is in the background in one culture tends to be a foreground in the other and vice versa um, and this does relate to a question which we can perhaps put up from R. Abdullah who says do you have guidance to segue from western norms to entertain rethinking individualism gently uh, do we see answers in holistic cultures such as in New Zealand where they integrate Maori thought so some specific ideas there, but I think the general idea is that if we believe that Western individualism needs to evolve and change, how do we do that gently? And I'm wondering, and my part of the question is, do you think it's because actually we can recognize that a lot of these values which are more dominant in, in Confucian influenced cultures, that they are also present in Western culture. It's just that they're not as, evident as some other ones? I think nowadays it is almost impossible for us uh, to live just 
in a Western way or in an Eastern way. We, the, the, those cultures are overlapping everywhere and contemporary capitalist society, uh, uh, Eastern norms and Western norms are mixed together. Uh, I think it, the future society, uh, we are witnessing more and more that kind of overlapping of values and, and culture uh, and, and other attitudes uh, and all sorts of things. Uh, but um, but we also but uh, have to learn from other cultures. Uh, but it, I, for me, I have experienced two cultures. I have lived in America for many years and for my study, and I, I, my life has been led uh, almost in in East Asian uh, context. Uh, what I have experienced is that Westerners do not really know about, uh, do not understand uh, or the, do not have willingness to understand other cultures. And they lay kind of imagination about what it would be like to live in another culture. Uh, as a foreigner, or they they really do not uh, have uh, that kind of empathical or the sympathetical attitude toward the other cultures. I, I think that kind of, of attitude made Vir Virginie Pradell uh, uh, go toward that kind of uh, the question and criticism. Uh, so the empathy is a very is very important uh, means to uh, many, very important means uh, for us to understand others, other ways of life. Uh, but it, how to? But the question is how to educate. Can we educate that kind of attitude of empathy or sympathy? How can we make students to understand others? Is there any efficient way of doing uh, that kind of education? Um, so I think experiencing or uh, enabling students to play with others from other uh, cultures or other values. Uh, I think uh, that kind of uh, making um, the uh, opportunity, uh, real opportunity to learn others is very important in education. Yeah, no, thanks, Richard. I, I, I think you're, you're, you're right. One thing that struck me when I was doing my little work on comparative philosophy was that when you went outside of the West, uh, philosophers outside of the West always had a deep knowledge of Western philosophy. Uh, in the West, very few philosophers had any um, knowledge of non-Western philosophy. So there's this asymmetry of ignorance was a phrase that somebody mm -hmm. used. And uh, thank you so much for your contribution to helping to, to sort of get, get rid of that. I just want to put up, not as, as, as a comment from Talbi Ismail, actually, just to underline the point I think we've made. Um, he says, are these political differences between East and West not being exaggerated? For instance, the Pope also washes the feet of the poor immigrant sinners in public ceremonies. And, and uh, no need to respond to that, but I think it just underlines the point. I think we have agreed that, um, you know, the, the cultures... There's nothing, as it were, completely unique to one culture that we don't find in others, and and there is a, a blending going on. Well, listen, thank you so much. It, it, we've kept you up ridiculously late. I think it's time to let you finally <laughs> yeah. um, sleep. Well, it's, it's, it's been a it's very a new experience for me. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a new experience, but it's a very interesting experience, and it's a really yeah. a pleasure and honor to be invited to this talk. And uh, it's good to see you uh, through online. Uh, someday, I, I hope I can meet you uh, directly in a room. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. yeah, that would be nice too. Thank you for everybody who's who's joined us this evening. Um, many more people will be watching it later, of course, because these talks get recorded. They stay on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you've enjoyed it, please do share it with other people, encourage others to, to watch. And do come back for our next one. Uh, next week's talk has had to be postponed, unfortunately. So the final talk will be in, of this series for now we've got a few to catch up on later, um, is going to be on the 26th of March from Deborah Satz, who's going to be arguing for a requirement of national public service. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Heisu Kim, and we hope to see you again soon.